So good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be uh, back uh, to uh, Brussels and to uh, meet a lot of uh, friends and uh, colleagues. Many thanks for uh, hosting us uh, here. Uh, 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 thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, thanks also to uh, Wind Europe and TREF for organizing this event. Dear colleagues, I want to, before going to Wind, I want to say where we are today is the world, because uh, the world is going through very difficult times in the Middle East, and these are all linked to energy issues. Oil markets are on edge, following every news, every step, what is happening in the Middle East. Why? Very simple. More than one third of the oil exports of the world comes from that region. If one or more major oil producers are involved in this way or that way, directly to the crisis, we may well see an, a shock, oil shock, and the prices may well go up significantly. And this happens, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, 50 years after we hit the first oil shock in the early 1970s. And again, this happens uh, only two years after we have seen under uh, the crisis in the natural gas markets after the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So two years ago, a natural gas crisis with all its shock waves in Europe and beyond, in terms of availability of gas, in terms of the gas and power prices. And now we are facing another crisis. We don't know if it happened or not, but markets are very nervous. And this is a very important at the time when the global economy is weak and the inflation numbers are already going upwards around the world. And Europe is not an energy island. What will happen in the Middle East, what happened in Russia, affects Europe and all other countries directly. So why I'm saying this is first bringing to your attention. And the second, in my view, when we talk about the energy security, in my view, as important as our fight against climate change, is when we look at it, goes through long-lasting solutions to our energy security problems. Is it more oil, it is more gas, or should we look at the alternatives? In my view, wind, solar, hydrogen, nuclear power, these are all alternatives to have a much secure energy world. So what, I'm, uh, what I will try to tell you in a few minutes, we shouldn't think of wind only as a means to reach our climate goals, but as a means of securing our energy supplies. They are homegrown, and nobody can create a problem when you have your wind at home in your own country, that it is coming from this country, that country, the shock here, that uh, shock there, it will not affect uh, the uh, generation of uh, wind electricity. So this is a one point I wanted to uh, start with, to show that the uh, wind and the renewables in general Clean energy in general is also a source of energy security. The second is, when we look at the, uh, why uh, we see overall around the world a big push for uh, wind, including uh, the countries in Asia, North America, and so on, this is not only to address the energy security and climate problems, but at the same time, they see it as an industrial opportunity. Uh, the colleagues have uh, uh, mentioned uh, China. If China has uh, today a pole position in many clean energy technologies, it is not uh, as a result of the major climate concerns. It was a strategic industrial policy of uh, China dominating the game now uh, big time. So from that angle for Europe, in my view, wind energy constitutes three dimensions. One, energy security second, industrial policy, and third, uh, reaching our climate targets. Some, uh, 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 almost five years ago, I was in Copenhagen 
together with Giles and with Danish uh, um, uh, minister, because it was the first uh, offshore wind outlook that the IEA and in the world has ever produced. What are the expectations of offshore wind? And in that meeting, in that conference, why did, normally we launch our reports in Paris you know, at our headquarters, but I chose that Copenhagen because the, the, it is the uh, birthplace of offshore wind to uh, respect the, our Danish uh, colleagues and their efforts there. Now, at that meeting, I remember very well, I said that we expect, we expect, as I hear, around 2027, wind will be the number one source of electricity generation in Europe. And now, today, we are at uh, the end of uh, 2023, and I can confirm you that we still expect very soon wind overtaking the other uh, energy sources will be set to be the number one source of electricity generation in Europe. This is excellent uh, uh, news, again, for all these uh, reasons I mentioned to you. But there are some issues. I see two issues here to bring to your attention. One, in fact, the growth of wind generation could be much faster than we are seeing uh, uh, now. But for this, there are some measures to be taken by the, uh, by the European governments, by the Commission, by the European Parliament, by, by the operators and others. The first one is the big issue, big hurdle of uh, licensing and permitting. How to make it much uh, faster. It is complex, it takes a lot of time, and it is really a, a killing a lot of projects uh, in place. This is the one area that uh, I really don't like to see, because in other countries it is much faster, less uh, complicated, and it goes very quickly. The second one, is a very important one. Again, uh, one week ago, we made a report on this. We make a lot of reports. It was on the grids. Grids are extremely important. Today in the world, 1,500 gigawatts of renewable capacity is waiting. They are ready, they are waiting to be connected to the grid and go to the consumers. They are just waiting there. It's unbelievable. 50% of it is in the United States, but about 25% in Europe. This is waste of money. Economically, it is criminal, I can tell you. Just you build the thing and you are just waiting for that. And this is a major issue. And in my view, this is the blind spot of the clean energy transition. And uh, I remember, uh, I think it was last year in Ostende, in, in Belgium, there was a wind offshore uh, meeting uh, that many leaders of the world, uh, pardon, Europe came together, how we can, how we can uh, revitalize the offshore wind in Europe, because there's a lot of potential in North Sea and elsewhere. In my speech, I told them to make it, in my view, with the intention of making it simpler, you build a very nice car, very efficient, very sustainable, very speedy, very quick, fast, and very nice looking with the nice colors. It's, everything is very good, but you forget to build the roads. If there is no road, car, it just doesn't mean anything. It stays in the, in the show of case. It is the same thing. If you, you can push a lot of emphasis on the building uh, wind and solar, but if you don't have the grids, you just uh, put it there. And today it is, uh, in my view, a major uh, obstacle as well. And the third point in terms of to bring a uh, growing very strongly uh, uh, wind penetration in Europe is the, uh, the supply, ch <clears throat> supply chain constraints. This is the third uh, uh, point together with the, uh, with the uh, grid issue, the issue of uh, licensing and uh, others. So uh, from uh, that point of view, it might be very important for Europe to simplify, digitalize the licensing and permitting. This is uh, one area that European uh, governments, European Commission uh, may want to think. The, that we need to improve the uh, auction design in order to reflect the 
day-to-day, -day, the macroeconomic context uh, we are in, in many countries it's a problem, including in the UK, uh, I, sh I, should, uh, I should say, and uh, that again uh, pay attention to grids. Because you build a solar panel solar, uh, uh, or, uh, or the wind in two, three years, but uh, building a, a grid takes about 10 years on average. So there's a big time lag that it should be foresight, it should be strategic uh, uh, thinking. So this is the first area that uh, I wanted to mention in terms of the wind and wind in, uh, growing much stronger. But as I said, we expect, we, even with this space, very soon wind to be the number one source of power in uh, Europe, which is a good news uh, for many reasons. And the second point I want to make is on the uh, supply chain. Europe was one of the uh, first regions uh, who uh, uh, started with the wind, but now, as uh, uh, Madame Commissioner mentioned, and, uh, and uh, as uh, Giles uh, mentioned, and uh, as we all uh, know, uh, the supply chain, the uh, how to uh, look at the industry of the wind, uh, China has a major, major uh, share and there's a lot of manufacturing capacity in the, in the pipeline coming. So I have no problem with any country. China was uh, quick to come and make the uh, necessary investment and strategy went frontal and build it there. But at the IEA, we believe in one thing. If there is a magic word in all energy sources. I'm looking at magic word is diversification. And I think Europe, in my view, in the past, made several, in terms of energy, strategic, historic mistakes. One of them was, in terms of natural gas, the over-reliance on one single country. And we paid for that. And we were still uh, going to pay uh, for, that, for that mistake. So uh, here, uh, in my uh, view, the wind industry uh, being in China has uh, implications uh, big time for Europe for two ways. One, the turbines coming from uh, more and more turbines from uh, China. They are becoming better quality, uh, more and more cost effective. And the second, if not the turbines themselves, there are a lot of components of the turbines coming uh, from uh, uh, China. So this is, it is the reason uh, why I believe there is a now Time to think about this uh, for the uh, Europe as an industry, how we are going to revitalize European uh, industry and diversify here. Within Europe, with the neighbors, as Madam Commissioner mentioned, with, with, uh, with Turkey or other countries, we have to find a diversification here to minimize the, or reduce the risks. And Today, dear colleagues, when we look around the world, the electric cars, solar panels, hydrogen electrolyzers, wind, there is a big race among the countries. I mentioned China, but the United States, the Inflation Reduction Act, in my view, it is the single most important action after Paris Agreement in terms of the pushing the clean uh, uh, industry. We have to compete with that as Europe. And we have to diversify our uh, uh, risks uh, here. And if Europe wants to have a competitive position in the next chapter of the clean energy technology manufacturing, Europe has to provide incentives for its industries, as the other countries uh, uh, do. I mentioned China and the United States, but India, through production-linked incentives, India is coming forward, Indonesia is coming forward. Uh, Canada. So therefore, it is uh, important to have, a, as I said, uh, uh, since two years, Europe needs to have a, a roadmap for uh, a new industrial strategy, how we are, as Europe, being to be competitive in the next chapter of the industry, industrial age, which is the age of clean energy technology manufacturing. Otherwise, uh, the industrial sector in Europe is suffering currently, because of the high energy prices, because the European industry uh, is modeled on the cheap Russian energies, and it is passé, it is over. 
how we are going to uh, uh, bridge the cost gap, the energy cost gap, and how we are going to prepare Europe for the next chapter of the industry needs a decent, well-studied uh, uh, an industrial uh, roadmap. And here, I think there is a need for uh, European uh, governments to look at the wind industry and not to make the same mistake we did for solar power. Today, solar is growing very strongly around the world, uh, dear colleagues, very strongly. Solar is everywhere. And today, 85% of the solar panels in the world, all of them are produced in one single country, China. Okay. And, but the issue is, 25 years ago, it was Europe which started this uh, solar industry with the subsidies and everything. Developing a clean energy technology is like a running a marathon, 42 kilometers. If you run the first 10 kilometers as Europe did in solar, you don't get any medal. You get the medal if you finish the 42 kilometers as number one. Nobody remembers who finished the first 10 kilometers. Everybody knows who finished the, uh, the 42 kilometers and China has finished the solar panel. I hope the same doesn't apply uh, uh, for wind. Uh, Europe has a very good position, advantageous position, but now it is time to come up with the common sense, real world policies in order to, A, to see a, a much faster deployment of uh, wind power, and B, uh, develop the European uh, uh, wind industry together with its uh, neighbors and uh, allies. Thank you very much.